Welcome to Teaching Artist Podcast, a show dedicated to discussions of teaching art to kids, making art, and how those things overlap and feed each other. I'm Rebecca Potts, your host, a visual arts teaching artist. I had such a meaningful talk with Morgan Otten Smith. Morgan is an abstract painter living in Northeast Georgia. Her work is an exploration of the intersection of individuality and motherhood. She is also an elementary art teacher, a wife, and a mother to twin three-year-olds. In addition to Georgia, Morgan has also lived in Germany, an experience that greatly shaped her as an artist. So I am here with Morgan Otten Smith. Welcome, Morgan. Thank you for taking the time. And it's very late for her right now. So (laughs) thank you. So I like to start with just kind of a little bit of background. How did you become an artist? And then the other side is how did you become a teacher? And did you always kind of plan on both? Or did one come first? Yeah, one did come first. The the desire to to be an artist came first. As As a kid, I would always play artist. Or, you know, I'd have my little drawings and I'd set them all out. And so I I was always interested in making art. I would always draw and make little things, crafty things. I don't know. Yeah. And even when I like wasn't in school for art or I mean, I guess, you know, in middle school, you're not in school for art, but you know what I mean. <laughs> right. <laughs> I was actively like pursuing taking classes and such. I was still drawing and being creative on the side. I went to college with the intention to be an English teacher. Oh, interesting. Because I loved to read and I loved history yeah. and literature. So it kind of combined them all, all the things I loved. And I don't know what brought me really to teaching besides, I guess, that I thought that I could study like literature and still make money. Right. Um, <laughs> I was, um, I was helping my friend write a paper one night and I was like, gosh, I hate this. <laughs> so I knew that I couldn't be an English teacher because right. you have to do so much. So There's many a lot paper of things. <laughs> Yeah. I was like, I just want to read. Can I just do that? <laughs> so I, I knew that I wanted to switch to art. Mm-hmm. And I think part of it was still in my head that like I had to teach art to make money. And I think part of it was also that I had to convince my parents that I could <laughs> be an artist and still have a livelihood right like support yourself exactly so it was it was kind of a practical thing that led me to teaching art but as soon as I got in the involved in the classes and started learning more about like the pedagogy and everything I was like yep uh this is where I should be so then it became more of a passion than a practicality so I got to marry both passions nice that's great and now do you feel like both passions really are sort of married like your teaching informs art making at all and does your art making also inform your teaching I I would say yes I try to be kind of a more of a facilitator in the classroom as opposed to like a creative dictator that may be harsh to say <laughs> but <laughs> I do like I do come up with certain projects for my students but then I I also like to give them lots of freedom in them so if they come up with an idea and they're, like, they're asking me I'm just like oh well try it yeah and I and I, I do a lot of that in my own art making as well like I I set out like with an idea but then if I get a you know a little itch along the way. I just try it out. So I kind of do both approaches in classroom and in my own practice. Nice. Yeah, I like that. I've been trying not always successfully to like take my own advice. You know, Mm -hmm. if I'm telling students, try it out. Sure. Like see what happens. Right. And then going back to my studio and being scared to do that. I'm like, no, stop. Like Mm -hmm. listen to yourself. Exactly. I'm doing a project right now with my fourth grade where we were studying uh, over Kandinsky's paintings and how his influence with music. And so I've played different things on different days and like, just, I was like, go grab whatever materials you want. Just practice. I was like, don't even worry about what it looks like. I just want you to know that you have the freedom and the ability to do what you want creatively. Right. And so I was like, I had the kind of the same thing. I was like, why did I just say that to myself too? 
Right. Just experiment. Yeah. And don't worry so much about the product. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And you teach elementary. Do you teach K through fifth, all the grades? Mm -hmm, I do. Yeah. It's my first first time. Well, first time. It's uh, my second year doing it. What grades were you before? I started out in middle school. Okay. And then I went to work at a private school where I taught kindergarten through 12th grade. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot. Like, my schedule was that kindergarten came and then my 11th graders came. Wow. That's <laughs> so a such a shift. <laughs> yeah. And then I did um, high school ceramics only for a few years. And then I ended up back here doing elementary. And is there one that you prefer? Like, is there a grade level you just love? Are there any that you're kind of like, I don't want to do that? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there's so many good things about each grade levels, you know, like, yeah, there's not one that I just won't do. Uh -huh. Before I started fully doing elementary, I would have said I didn't want to do it. But now that I'm here, I really, I really enjoy it. So I think I think I'm just kind of up for whatever. <laughs> Yeah, I don't I don't mind. I, like, I just like to teach art. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel like I know for me, I before teaching elementary and also before becoming a parent, I, I kind of said the same thing. Like I only want to work with the older kids, but now I'm teaching elementary and love it. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel like becoming a parent changed that at all? Yeah, probably. It's probably helped my patients a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And even still there are moments where I'm like, are you kidding me? Right. But it, it, I mean, kids are kids. So you have those yeah. Yeah. no matter what what grade you what teach. age yeah <laughs> even with adults sometimes oh yeah I've taught adults too and I have those moments yeah and I also saw that you spent time in Germany were you teaching when you were there yeah that's where I taught ceramics oh okay cool yeah, I worked at a international high school there awesome. so it was an American high school a lot of business students and um it was like a there's partially religious organization to it so there's a lot of missionary students there yeah so yeah, we li my husband worked in the library and we lived there for about three years. Wow. Yeah, that's where our kids were born was in Germany. Oh, wow. I So my daughter was born in Prague. Ooh. We lived there for, I guess, also almost three years. So just a lot of little overlaps here. <laughs> yeah, that's so cool. That was somewhere that we, we wanted to go while we were in Europe and just never made it there. Uh, it's gorgeous. If you get back, you should go check it out. I so said we want to go back. It's like as soon as as soon as we can afford to. Right. I know. We keep telling our daughter, "We'll take you back." You like you'll yeah. see it someday. Yeah, we do the same thing. It's like we'll take you to the house you were born in and uh, all that. <laughs> yeah. What part of Germany were you in? It's the very southern part. Is like where France and Switzerland and Germany all oh, touch. Gorgeous. So we were oh. really like. 20 minutes from Basel, Switzerland. Yeah. So we would, you know, we'd hop on the bus and go there on the Saturdays. It was fantastic. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. It was a great experience. Did it, did it change your like teaching style or, or your art making or both? It did in a like pretty basic way because before I taught ceramics, like I was a painter when I was, at, you know, in the States before, right. but then becoming a ceramics teacher, I started being a potter. So yeah. I spent those three years, you know, being a ceramicist instead of a painter. So those were, I don't know, that was just really cool to shift totally to a different medium yeah. entirely. But then like I would use some of my painter training and like on the glazes that I'd use and how I'd apply them. Yeah. And, a lot of my a lot of drawing came through. Mm. So it's kind of a neat overlap. Yeah, that's always interesting when you can combine those experiences. Mm -hmm. Now, do you feel like you ever like want to go back to ceramics? Or do you still do ceramics? I don't I don't have any access to a, a kiln or a studio at all. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's the hardest part. It, right? It is. It is. Yeah. And I'm, I'm afraid like I'd get on the wheel again. and I'd be like, uh, what? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I forgot how to do this. Yeah, yeah. Though I've never been able to, <laughs> to <laughs> do the wheel. It's hard. Yeah, it's funny because I hated it when I was in college, and it was one of the, like I had to take like certain certain subjects in higher level. So it was the higher higher level classes that I took were in pottery. So that's how I got like that solid back 
ground foundation in it. Yeah. But I was never pleased with the wheel. And then I had to teach myself again how to do it, you know, to go teach high schoolers to do it. Yeah. And then I fell in love. Uh, so it's just, it was the wrong time, I guess, for me when I was younger. Yeah. And there's something about having to teach it and then seeing, like, seeing the students get excited about something that maybe also helped, like, shifts it for you. Oh, yeah. It makes it, it's a great motivator. Yeah, definitely. What else, I guess, what excites you about teaching what that there's one that keeps you going like the students being a motivator Mm -hmm. yeah I think for me it's all about the creativity I think our kids are pushed so hard in school even if like the little the little babies the little kindergartners they have so much they have to perform right that it's it's a huge motivator for me like to make sure that they have a, a safe space in their art room where they can just be themselves they can they can experiment they don't have to perform these pressures, you know, they just kind of get to to realize the relaxing quality that can be in art. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess it's just a big motivator for me to let like teach the kids to chill out a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> if that's not too cop out, I guess. No, I mean, I feel like that's really important with this like overly tested environment that they live in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I see, I mean, I see that in my students too, that they love coming to art and just a lot of them do use it as a place where they can be more free and more relaxed and just kind of enjoy creating without so much focus on the product or like memorizing something. Yes. And I don't know if you have this, this, I guess it's a problem, but do you have like certain students that they just can't let go of that mindset? Like I have some that will just get so upset that their picture doesn't look like what I drew when I was showing them how to do it. They get so focused on like uh, the level of perfection that they want, and if they don't achieve it, they just completely shut down. Yeah, and those are the kids that I just want to be like, "You need to love it. It's gonna be fine. Yeah. It's okay. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's okay." <laughs> I was like, you're seven years old, right? <laughs> I've been doing this longer than you've been alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I. A lot of times, I don't even finish a demo. Mm -hmm. And I like intentionally, I'll do things kind of upside down. So I'm drawing like on my belly in front of them. Yeah. (laughs) Um, And it's drawing upside down. So it's like intentionally not very good. Yep. Yeah. I do that a lot. I do that a lot where I just like don't. Yeah, exactly. I just quit. I was like, okay, and you know what to do now. Right. I'll be like, you get the idea. I want you to have time for your own art making. So I'm, am I done with this? And they'll be like, no, you have to do this and this. And I'm like, yeah, see, you know what I need to do. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Now it's your turn. (laughs) Exactly. Yep. I do that too. Yeah. Cause they do definitely, if you make something that's sort of like perfected to the level that you would do in your own work Mm -hmm. there, it's very intimidating. It can be very intimidating. Yeah. So I'll make a a demo and it's kind of more more for me than anybody because it's like you know when I'm coming up with a lesson I was like this is what I'll I'll, I'll make and and then I'll show it to them for like 30 seconds I'm like okay we're making this and then I'll take it away <laughs> I was like because I don't need them to sit there and look oh her lines are so straight whatever yeah. for my teaching I'm shifting towards tab which is oh, like okay. sort of extreme choice. Yeah, I want to do that next year. Um, I'm struggling with the younger grades, partly mm. because I have very limited time with them. Yeah. So with the younger grades, it's still more project-based mm-hmm. um, with me coming up with projects. Right. And I've started, I usually do make demos just to kind of test things out, but I've started mm-hmm not even showing like the demo is solely for me. They never even see it Mm -hmm. to help avoid that. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. So I I want to try to shift towards TAB next year. I actually work at two schools because I'm in so um, rural of an area that they just don't have the population for me to be there all week for one school. So I work two days at one and three at the other. Wow. And are they far apart from each other or far from you? No. Well, they are far from me. (laughs) I live an hour away from where I teach. Oh, wow. They're 10 minutes apart, though, the schools are. Okay. So I, I work 
more, I end up working more at one school than the other. Or I guess I not really working, but like I see the kids more because right. there's less classes of each grade, you know? So the one that I see the most, I want to transition to a little bit more TAB and then maybe the following year, you know, like bring it in more. Yeah. Subtly. Yeah. I think that makes sense to kind of slowly like ease into it mm -hmm. and figure out how it works for you. Cause it is, it really depends on like your style and the, the how the schools work and how the students respond to it and you know everything it's I feel like it's a very individual thing to kind of figure out mm -hmm. exactly and I don't want to shock them either right they're like <laughs> you do whatever you want I know that's not what it's like but <laughs> free for all time <laughs> yeah <laughs> It's free day every day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've structured it as we start. Like I get basically 10 weeks with every grade. So it's a mm -hmm. really short time. Yeah. And I've split it. So like the first half is still sort of more teacher directed projects, but quick mm -hmm. projects that are just basically to introduce all the materials I have available. Mm -hmm. And then the last half is, okay, now we know what materials there are. We've tried a few techniques in the short time that we have and go for it. And we talk through, you know, planning and how do artists get ideas? And when you have an idea, what do you do with it? Mm -hmm. All of these things. But that that's an interesting way that I've seen my students start to sort of wrap their heads around it. And I'm sure it'll mm -hmm. shift for me as I like this this is my first year doing this, this method. So yeah, it'll keep shifting. Well, let me have all your tips. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's my next question for you too. Like what tips do you have? <laughs> yeah. I guess for me, the biggest, the biggest tips I feel like I just said are just to, to do what feels right for you and what kind of makes mm -hmm. sense for you. The other main thing that made a big difference for me was spending a lot of time like right before school started setting up my room mm -hmm. um, and I'm at two schools also one is on a cart so that's more challenging oh wow yeah <laughs> but the one where I have a room I reorganized everything and labeled everything so it's all kid accessible right and that's that's a huge shift that now they know where to find things and if they don't they can like look around and find things mm -hmm. and then that makes them responsible for getting their own supplies out of what is now their own studio and then putting mm -hmm. their own supplies away where it goes in their studio. <laughs> I've started training a little bit on that because yeah. I've stopped putting the supplies out for them. I'm like, all right, you know where the bins are? Right. Go get your bin, go get your materials. You have five minutes to get all the things that you need. Yeah. Partially because I don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> right. <And two. laughs> like it is, it is theirs. It is their choice. Like they need to go do it on their own. Yeah. And it's, I feel like it's really good for them to learn that responsibility mm -hmm. and to kind of have ownership there as well as the art making. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So what what would your tips be for like a new art teacher coming in? Because you've taught all ages and a variety of mm -hmm. media. I think my tip would be you don't have to be a certain type of art teacher or a certain type of person to be an art teacher. Uh, yeah. I think that there's a lot of art teacher superstars and I've noticed like younger art teachers, like fresh out of the gate, trying to be those superstar art teachers. Yeah. And I want to be like, you don't have to be that person. Like if you like some of the, I mean, I use some superstar art teacher lessons and they've worked out really well. Yeah. But I, I don't, it's just not, I'm not the kind of person, like I'm not a costume person. I'm not going to dress up. That's just not me. You know, I don't throw glitter around everywhere. Right. So I just, like, just make sure that you are being you. Because you'll definitely burn out if you're trying to be somebody else while you're being an art teacher. You know what I mean? Yeah. And like I'm, I have a pretty dry like sense of humor, and I, I do have a little sarcasm. Like one of the things they told me in, in like ed my education classes were not to use sarcasm with the kids, uh, but I do, yeah. and they get it because I'd be like, I love it when you don't listen to me. <laughs> And then they go, I said, do you know what sarcasm is? And they go, yes, that was sarcasm. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, then yeah, you need to listen to me. Yeah. So I think it's just important just to know what you are and, and are not capable of or interested in being and don't feel pressured to be somebody you're not just because of your profession. Yeah. Like not fitting yourself into some mold of what you think an art teacher is. Yeah, exactly. Nice. I think that's a really good one. I think that's what that's what I would have liked to have, have heard when I was starting. Yeah. To like just be yourself and let the kids see who you are too. Yeah. 
and even like the younger kids, because I, yeah. I did kind of had that, like, I did try to do that again, when I was starting with teaching just the younger kids, I was like, Oh, I have to be like a performer on all the time. And the this is my second year doing it. But now I'm just kind of like, No, I'm just I'm just Morgan. And I just teach art to, to little kids. Yeah. And it's great. Yeah. Do you feel like now you have twin three year olds? <laughs> do you <laughs> do you like test out lessons on them or anything? Do you do a lot of art with them? My son does not care at all. <laughs> so I'm not really <laughs> I'll pull out like watercolor paints and everything and um yeah. he'll do it for like a minute or two and then he'll move on. But my daughter, she'll sit with she'll sit and paint with me and so yeah, the other day she was really cute. She's like, I'm an artist like mommy. Oh. And I was like, yes, you are. That's so sweet. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't really test out lessons. I just kind of hang out with them and paint yeah. with them. My son always ends up just wanting me to draw Sesame Street characters, and I don't like to do that. So I'm just kind of like, ah, I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just like you draw the you draw you try to time. draw that yeah yeah <laughs> yeah my I have a four-year-old and I do sometimes now she's almost the same age as my youngest mm-hmm. students because I have TK which is like four and a half oh wow yeah coming in and I usually don't see them till the end of the year so they're usually five by the time I see them mm-hmm. but I've always that's like the grade that I struggle the most with the little ones yeah so I do kind of like I'll be like, okay, I have this lesson idea. Let's see. Can she do it? <laughs> How long is it going to take her? Oh, I'll definitely do it when they're older. <laughs> yeah. And I've, I've already been like, all right, I have kids that can't, uh, can't use scissors. So I'm going to make sure that my kids know how to use scissors. Right. And and can draw a square, you know. Yeah. So I do kind of have this. It's like mine won't be the ones that don't know how to use scissors. Right. Yeah. And shifting gears a little bit, I want to talk more about your artwork and your art making. Okay. I guess to start with that, could you describe your work for somebody who hasn't seen it? Uh, I can try. <laughs> yeah. I know that's a really hard question for a visual person. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I do, I've shifted back to painting now that we're back in the States and I don't have access, you know, to ceramic yeah. material. So I'm back to painting. I paint in the abstract, like non-representational style. Before I went to ceramics, uh, <laughs> I went to ceramics. I, I was a little bit more representational when I was in school. I did a lot of, I keep talking like I was in school like five years ago. It's definitely almost 10, yeah. but <laughs> it's like my art pinpoint, you know? Yeah, I still do that too. Okay, good. I'm glad. I'm not the only one. It's not like I'm reliving like, oh, the glory days. It's just, yeah. it was formative, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. It's one time when you have time to just focus on your art. Yes. And that's probably what it is. It's the last time that I was only doing art. Yeah. Yeah. So I did a lot of anatomical stuff. And then I shifted uh-huh. into using a lot of the anatomical stuff in more abstracted ways. And then I just kind of abandoned that altogether. Uh-huh. But I still have like an interest in anatomy. So a lot of my shapes end up looking like body parts. Yeah. So it's kind of unintentional. But then I'll look at them later. And I'm like, Oh, that looks like a liver. Yeah. So because <laughs> I was flirting with medical illustration as a possibility at one point. So that's why I was kind of really into it. Oh, yeah. But yeah, I do a lot of like a lot of shapes and with colors and like really organic type shapes. And then I use uh, oil pastels or watercolors on top to make it multi-layered. And yeah, I just, I don't know. I just kind of do whatever I want. So sometimes they're big sweeping shapes and sometimes it's like, kind of like Joan Mitchell-esque where I just kind of like blah, attack the canvas, you know, <laughs> with different colors. And yeah. It really just depends on my mood and my anxiety levels that, that week. Yeah. So do you feel like making art is almost a therapy or a way of just, you know, getting, getting things out there? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 I couldn't, I couldn't quit. Like I've tried before because it isn't, you know, if it's just a hobby in, in quotations, like it's a very expensive hobby. Right. And so like I felt guilty about it for a long time and I was trying not to paint or not to go to Michael's when they have the two for one <laughs> sale and all that. Yeah. And then I just kind of realized it's like, this is what I need to do. Like, it's not like I need to feel guilty about it. It is something that I just, I have to do Yeah, for my mental health and ultimately like for my mental health and then that is helpful for my family. Right. And it's such a part of you. Yeah. Because I'm a healthier person. Yeah. And then I guess speaking of the the cost of creating it, yeah. then I know you have been, you know, selling and showing your work. You have a 
solo show coming up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you find opportunities? Where where do you sell things? And sort of if you could talk more about that. Yeah, I, I have a website. So I have, you know, my little square space and my shop set up in that. So I sell every now and then. It's not, I, I really am grateful that it's not my source of income because I think that it would... Um, it would stress me out. Like it would, like I talked about my anxiety and like, I do have an anxiety problem. So it would ruin the creativity for me if it was what I depended on. So, you know, selling occasionally, that's just fine. Yeah. I did have to kind of like un internalize the capitalism of I'm only worth what I sell. So my work is only worthy when it's being sold and all that. But right. You know, I'm still working through that. It's a hard thing. (laughs) (laughs) It is. So I sell occasionally and most of it just ends up in my basement. Yeah. That's fine too. But I do a lot of shows. So like last year, I did, I think I did 13 shows. Wow. that And I just find them online. Like I just Google calls for art. And I know of the of local um, community art centers that have shows. And before we moved to Germany, I did a show at the local coffee shop that has a gallery in it. So I just contacted them again. And I was like, hey, I did a show in 2016. Could I do another one? And they were like, yeah, come on. Awesome. So I did that. And I've got one, a solo show booked in December at a, um, a local community art gallery so that I worked at before oh no nice. so yeah it's it's a, a lot of it's building relationships and yeah some of it's just not being afraid to ask yeah that's huge yeah just putting yourself out there and being like hey can I put my put my work up yeah I did that the, that time and it worked out now I'm trying to talk myself into doing it again because <laughs> <laughs> I have another glimpse of an opportunity you know and I'm like oh I'll just wait I'm not ready I'll just wait uh, yeah but I I really like there's nothing to wait for like I just need to like they're gonna say like the worst they can say is no and like I hear no a lot right so it's not that big of a deal yeah <laughs> yeah so many times it's we like build it up more in our heads mm-hmm. and just put up these artificial blocks yeah I mean I'm telling this to myself as much as anybody <laughs> it's like just go for it <laughs> <laughs> yeah I mean I could tell you all day long I was like just don't just ask it doesn't hurt anything to ask but then I'm the one that's sitting by my computer are like, I don't want to email them. Right. Yeah. It is almost, I was thinking back to how you said you have work that's kind of just sitting in the basement, but then you're showing a lot mm-hmm. and that they kind of go together that you've got enough work where you can be like, Hey, I can just, you know, I've got this awesome artwork that I want to put out into the world and share, even if it's not bought, it's at least like getting seen. Mm-hmm. I feel like my struggle is I do have things that are sitting around, but I struggle to find time to even make enough to like Mm -hmm. want to say hey can I do a solo show then I would be like oh I need to make enough work for a solo show (laughs) (laughs) yeah I don't know how it happened but I hustled so much last year like 2019 I made so many pieces and had a whole bunch of those yeah so I've given myself permission I was like there's nothing to hustle for in 2020 like (laughs) I'm giving myself the permission to experiment just to play around with color or throw a canvas on the wall and see what happens like I don't need it to be for anything because I have all these paintings that I can put in shows if I want to keep going like that in 2000 from 2019 yeah so I am slowing down nice and it's nice to think of that sort of shift and that that there can be sort of seasons in your work Mm -hmm. if you think of it like that that you can have this this time of really hustling and then you can slow down and experiment again almost like put yourself back in art school mode Mm -hmm. where you can kind of test things out That's exactly what I want to do because I have, like, just an example, I have all this muslin that I actually used Mm. to decorate when when I got married. Like, my husband and I, we got married in a barn. So 2012. (laughs) So we got married in a barn. And uh, so we put muslin through the rafters. So I have yards and yards of this stuff. So, like, I stretched it on stretcher beams and muslin is very thin. So that was an experiment that went pretty well. But now I have, like, scraps. So I'm just, like, throwing a scrap up on a canvas and putting some gesso on top and painting on that yeah. Ooh. just throwing things around and seeing what happens yeah so then it's like layers of these scraps yeah layering on top of the canvas mm-hmm. that's what I'm working on now it's just kind of playing with how many layers can I build mm-hmm. do I want yeah. the layer to be a color or is it just uh-huh. painted on top of so I have some scraps that I've painted and then I apply them Ooh. some that I just put up the plain muslin and then paint over it just to kind of see I don't know I'm just playing around yeah yeah. So it becomes like, like I have a vision, like I want it to be very color field y, but not like tight, you know, so yeah. 
I'm just seeing how I get there, I guess. Right. Ooh, I like that. Because it's added texture, but then it almost becomes like collage as well. Yeah, 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 exactly. Ah. And I can see that with your shapes too, that sometimes that texture might break a shape a little bit, but it's like Mm -hmm. the same color or it might create its own, you know, color, like the color field idea. Right. Interesting. I'm excited to see what happens with this and where this goes. (laughs) Oh, thank you. (laughs) I guess getting into to that work. You talked a little bit about it, but who are your your big influences? Do you have artists that you just like love and keep coming back to? I do. And I, I guess it's it's kind of become stereotypical, like the Ninth Street women, like the um, yeah. um, Joan Mitchell, Lee Krasner, Helen Frankenthaler. And I don't know so much of it is that they're painting or just their, their general awesomeness right. and, and persistence through a time when it, the field, I mean, it is still male dominated, but was even more male dominated. I don't know. I just finished that that huge book, Night Street Women. Yeah. So I'm pretty fired up. And like I finished it and then I started it over again. Uh, uh, <laughs> so I still have to read it. It's on my list. <laughs> it's it's huge. So I told you I have an hour drive to work. So I did it on Audible. Oh, nice. So so that helped a lot. But it was st- it's a 40 hour book. Wow. So, you know, it's a solid work week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I really enjoy and like some of my influences aren't even like in my style, you know, it's just people that I admire. Like I love Kiki Smith yeah. and Yoyoi Kusama. So I have found like myself gravitating to female artists when I was in school and in, in younger, I was, you know, all I, all I knew were the male artists, but yeah, now it's all, it's all women. Yeah. And do you feel like when you're teaching, do you try to show more of those artists as well? To the- I do. Yeah. I've tried lately. I've tried to, to, I want it to be like a side project of mine. I want to create like a database for myself. So when I go to teach still life and Instead of just teaching Henri Matisse and, you know, I teach, I can never say her name right, uh, Birthday Morissant instead or in addition to. So I try to always show a female counterpart or or and or a person of color counterpart yeah. of, of an artist. Awesome. So I, I want to, you know, in all my free time, <laughs> I want to make like a database either for myself or to like to share with other art teachers of like, when you teach this person, how about also teaching so and so and so and so. Right. Yeah. So maybe I can do that over the summer. Yeah, I love that idea. And then I mean, that that could be just something you put out there or it could be another little like like, put it on teachers pay teachers. Oh, hey, <laughs> must make that money. Yes. <laughs> Again, so I can go to Michael's when they have the two for one. Buy some more canvases. More paints. That's more right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. Okay, thinking about both teaching and art making, how do you fit it all in Mm -hmm. with your full time teaching twin three year olds, (laughs) and then somehow also making all of this art and doing shows all of it how do you do it <laughs> I don't know um <laughs> I do have a very supportive yeah. network so my husband's very supportive my parents are very close by and very supportive so they will take my kids on Friday nights so that my husband and I we get to have dinner together or you know just a date or just stay home together so we have our time alone and then he works he works from four in the morning till 12 wow. at like noon so he has to go to bed super early so by the time that like like by 7.30, everyone in my house is asleep <laughs> but me. Yeah. So that's usually when I get a lot of stuff done. It's just it's just kind of how the schedule works out. Yeah. So that like after bedtime painting, art making. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's that painting at night thing, you know? Yeah. I know. I do the same thing as soon as my daughter's asleep. <laughs> and my husband has a later schedule. So he's up, but he's often sometimes mm-hmm. we'll be in our little shared studio and he's like messing around making music and I'm painting or doing something with clay or doing I don't know making something (laughs) yeah that'd be awesome I'd love to share a space like that yeah yeah I work in a little basement bedroom like our basement's not like we rent so it's not even ours but like the basement's fit not finished but the one bedroom is because I think they had like a teenage daughter Uh, so that's my studio and it's tiny and my husband's tried to come down here with me but he's always in the way yeah (laughs) (laughs) and and he feels that way so he's like Uh, I'm just gonna go upstairs yeah we don't both fit (laughs) yeah it's like I'm so sorry oh I love you you can go do your thing and I'll do my thing yeah yeah the spaces that we create yeah uh, we're in a two-bedroom apartment so this is our like second bedroom is mm-hmm. a 
us a bedroom and a shared studio for both of us. Oh, wow. But we actually, we built a, Mur- we put a Murphy bed in here. So a bed that can lift up and get out of the way. Oh, nice. Yeah. Which is really the only way it would work. Yeah. Because I mean, you have to have a lot of supplies, right? Yeah. Like I have a ton of stuff. He has a ton of music stuff. Uh-huh. Yeah. And then if you want to make a big, like I I saw, I think on your Instagram, I saw pictures of you with like moving big paintings around. Or, uh, oh my gosh. It's just, yeah, it's like a dance. Yeah. It's like this one needs to go over here. Because I do, I do work like four foot by four foot. Wow. And my, I'm looking at it right now. The room down here, it's like, I'm not a good judge. I don't know. It's yeah. small. <laughs> I was about to give you an estimate of the studio room. I don't know what it it's is. It's small. A little little bedroom. It's small. Yeah. Do you have any tips for artists who like want to get into teaching or sort of the flip side of that for teachers who want to be more serious about their art making? Um, I feel like I'll start with the teacher one. Like, yeah. I know a lot of art teachers who don't have an art practice and a lot of their reasoning is I just don't have the time. Yeah. And that might be true because like I can't speak for everybody's schedules but I I want to I always I always want to shake those people and be like I think you can do it. Yes. <laughs> you can make the time. So, I mean like again, I don't want to preach anybody, but it, I think like you can you can try to make the time. Like just find out a little time in the day and like maybe you paint small and like, maybe you pull out your watercolors and you do a little 5 by 5 inch yeah. thing. You don't have to have, you know, the big studio or like whatever, just maybe just try a little bit. And I think that once like you start to, to try it again like you'll get bitten and you'll like just jump right back in yeah that's what I you know but again I don't want to judge anybody but I know a lot of our teachers who don't have an art practice and I just like I don't understand how you can do that yeah yeah that baffles me a little bit too how are you yeah well yeah because I asked you guys about that in the um yeah in that group like do you know art teachers that that don't because I was just kind of floored when I was like really you don't do anything huh, all right yeah. I was like I kind of ha- I have to or I'll go crazy right Right. Yeah. And being, yeah. you're, I mean, you're sort of immersed in it all the time. You're seeing your kids, your students creating. Yeah. And I mean, you're, I guess for some art teachers, maybe that just creating demos and creating lessons is enough. It has to be like, and I guess like, I mean, I, you do, you put a lot of effort and time and, and care into your demos. So I, that, yeah. that might be all that they need and good for them. Yeah. But yeah, I, it would drive me crazy. Yeah. What was the, what was the other part of your question? Oh, I guess the kind of flip side of that is artists who are interested in teaching, Mm -hmm. but maybe haven't gone that art ed route in school. Mm -hmm. Any tips there? Like should, should they go back to school or is there, what else would you say to them? I guess it depends on like how, how I want to make sure I'm being kind to everybody. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? (laughs) Right. (laughs) I don't know. I think there's, there's a lot of good things that you learn from going back to school. Yeah. But there's also, there's a lot of jobs that you could get without it, but I think you should definitely like read about teaching art right. and get yourself a book on classroom management because if you don't have classroom management you're going to lose it and it will be it will be you'll burn out so fast yeah so a lot of the things I tell people it's just like just you don't want to get burnt out so protect yourself from burnout yeah yeah because I the, when I taught at that private school like I didn't have to have a ed degree I just had to have the bachelor so like you have if you have an art degree then you, you have there's a lot of places that you could teach right but I would say definitely at least read books on teaching art and your management stuff. Here's where I should have said, which books do you recommend? But hindsight is 2020. As for classroom management, I'd recommend Teach Like a Pirate by Dave Burgess and Classroom Management for Art, Music, and PE Teachers by Michael Linson. I also highly recommend Studio Thinking from the Start, the K-8 Art Educator's Handbook, if you're interested in teaching for artistic behavior. That's the tab or T-A-B thing Morgan and I talked about. I'll link to all these books in the show notes. And now back to our conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I found because I I actually don't have an ed degree. Mm -hmm. I have a BA and then an MFA. But I did read a lot. And my I grew up with teachers. My whole family is teachers. Yeah. But I found that as as a teaching artist, at least here in California, the way it works is because I don't have an ed degree, and I'm not a certified teacher, Mm -hmm. the certified teacher has to stay in the classroom with me. Okay. And which is amazing, because most of them are very involved 
involved and they jump in if needed with classroom management. Mm -hmm. But it also means that I see the entire school's worth of classroom management styles. Oh, yeah, that would be interesting. And I kind of pick, you know, what things work for me and make sense for my personality and what things I see other teachers doing that are really successful. Mm -hmm. So getting to kind of learn that way has been amazing. Like, I feel like I've grown so much just in I've been in this position for three years and it's really helped my classroom management. Yeah, I'd love to be able to see that. Yeah. Like, just to kind of like see what other teachers do, even just regular ed. I'd love to I'd just like love to see that. That's cool. Yeah, it's pretty amazing to have them in the room with you and just see how, a little bit of like it's a sort of a snippet of how they teach because mm-hmm. they're I mean, they're obviously not leading the lesson I am. But right. They they jump in if needed. And some of them do that more than others. It varies a bit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like some are kind of in the back grading, which is fine. I've got like I've got control over it. <laughs> right. Yeah. So can I, can I ask you a question? Like, do you feel like sure. like do you feel valued as an art teacher or do you feel like you're the babysitter for the other teachers? No. Well, I think partly because they have to be there, Mm -hmm. they don't really get it as a prep, which sometimes I am almost apologetic about that. Like, I I wish I was certified so you could just (laughs) drop off the kids and go have a prep. But I do feel like they come in and most of the teachers are also kind of soaking up what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Like, I do feel valued in that way that because I have their students for only 10 weeks, I rotate through the different grades. So then for the rest of the school year that I'm not with them, they are like back to being responsible for art. Mm -hmm. So it's this 10 weeks of sharing with the students, but also sharing with the teachers. So they teach art when you're not teaching art? Yeah. (laughs) Whoa. Okay. I'm learning so much. Yeah. Yeah. There is no, like I'm, I'm it for the art teacher. Wow. Okay. Yeah. It's so funny how different states do stuff differently. Yeah. And I mean, it varies a lot school to school and district Mm -hmm. to district here, Mm -hmm. but there are, there are a lot of schools that don't have an art teacher and instead work with a nonprofit like, you know, my employer that sends artists into schools to do that. Huh. And I know we're funded and our mu- we have a, a music teacher who's a full-time music teacher, but those both of our positions are funded through like grants and the PTA. It's not through the regular school budget. Oh, wow. Yeah. Which is a little sad. How interesting. Yeah. I was going to say, that's really neat, but also very sad. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I think it's neat that they still found the value and found a way to, to make art and music happen. Yeah. But it is a little depressing that they had to do that in the first place. Right. And that it's not, I guess that question of value is like, it's not more valued by, you know, the people making decisions and budgeting and all of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I feel like it's getting late for you. It's fine. Like um, I said, I don't have to work in the morning. And I had my, I had my little nap. So yeah. I'm good. <laughs> I was gonna go into our kind of just get to know you questions. Mm -hmm. One, what are you curious about right now? That's a tough one. It is. I don't want to sound so redundant where it's just like art, 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 art. Yeah. But, but that's it. That's... No, it really is. Like <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I, I really want to go back to school. I want to go get a master's degree in art history. So Ooh. I've kind of just been reading all of the art history I can get my hands on. So like I did Night Street Women and now I'm reading a book about the history of fabric Ooh. because, you know, I'm, I'm a super fun person. <laughs> So I'm reading a book about fabric and then I have a little... That does sound interesting though. It really does. It's fascinating. It is fascinating. So I'm reading another little, it's a little small book about six Mm. black masters of American art. So I want to keep expanding my knowledge of people of color in the art world. And yeah, so I'm just like any art history book that I can grab, I'm I'm, I'm reading that. Yeah. So that's what I'm curious about. It's like all aspects of art history right now. Nothing's off limits. I just want to know it all. Okay. And then is there mm-hmm. anything you are not very good at? Uh, like art wise or just in life? <laughs> in life in general, just to like little get to know you. Oh. Like I almost always with this one would say math is not my strong suit. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> and my mom was a math teacher. So. 
<laughs> mine was too. Mine, mine is oh. too. She's retiring this year, but she's a math teacher. Oh, crazy. Oh. And I was homeschooled for elementary school. So like the part she taught me, I remember. Right. I can do the addition. I can multiply in my head. I can make percentages. But when it gets to adding letters in it, oh. no, no, no. Yeah. So yeah, I'm definitely with you on that one. It's like math. I am not good at math. Yeah. And that was it when they started throwing letters in there. I'm like, what are these yes. letters doing? Why? <laughs> Why do you need this? Uh, yeah, yeah. I st- I don't need it. I don't ever use it. Yeah. I re- I use fractions a lot. I'm good with those still. You know, figuring out measurements for canvases and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not good like day to day planning. I like to I like to kind of like fly by the seat of my pants and do whatever I feel like doing. Yeah. But that just kind of doesn't play well anymore. I mean, that was nice when I was in my 20s and I didn't have kids and all that. But <laughs> yeah, a little harder. Like, there's just so much. Yeah. And there's so many things I need to do during the day. So I like I. Feel I hate it. I've started scheduling out like my free time <laughs> during the week. Yeah. And it's just like, who am I? Yeah. I don't like this. So yeah, I'm not good at planning, I guess. Yeah, it is. It's hard. Yeah. And it. I feel like it only gets harder as your kids get older and more, you know, involved in all these different things yeah. that you've got to somehow keep track of. And yeah, oh, yeah that's a tough one. You know, I just want to, I want to be the free spirit. Yeah. And scheduling all this stuff. I can't be the free spirit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know for me, it's helped a lot to just like, as frustrating as it is sort of in a, like the mentality of it is frustrating, mm-hmm. but practically it does help to like put it in my like Google calendar so that it pops up with a little reminder beforehand being like you have to do this even if it's like you know some appointment that my daughter has or if it's like don't forget to bring this to school today (laughs) like put it in there yeah yep I do that too yeah because it's like I will forget it's you know I'm at the point where I don't write it down I I will probably forget yeah yeah and I I used to put like I would be one of those people that has a million post-it notes everywhere Mm -hmm. and then lose half of them I said they fall off. Yeah. <laughs> They're not as sticky as you want them to be. Nope. So I've I've started trying to like rely more on technology. Like put it in Google mm-hmm. Calendar and it can't disappear. It's in there and it's gonna like pop up on my phone with a little reminder. I've started doing that too, but then you know what? I want to go back and look like oh, because my son all right, well, my son has cerebral palsy, so mm. we have a lot of doctor's appointments and stuff. So I'll look back through and be like, all right, when was his last appointment? And I can't find it anymore because it doesn't save past appointments. Uh, uh, it's like that needs to be that's a bug fix that yeah, needs to happen that's frustrating yeah or like just something simple like when is my last hair appointment yeah I need to get it cut it doesn't save those last appointments I wonder I bet there's an app or something there's got to be there's got to be something else that could help with this yeah or you know just go back to the paper planner yeah and not lose it <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I would love to hear more about pregnancy. I know we talked about how we both actually were pregnant while living abroad and sort of how that was what happened yeah and how that affected you and and your sort of career your art making. Yeah, so we were in in Germany for two and a half years. We had to leave a little sooner than we thought. So we were planning on leaving at three, but it was like two and a half. It was more than two and a half. It was closer to three, but we had to leave a little early. But I was teaching ceramics and I got pregnant. So I was planning on just finishing out that year. But then, you know, I found out that it was twins and that comes with a whole other set of issues. Right. Yeah. I'm, I got, what's it called? Gestational diabetes, which they assured me was pretty common with twins and I had to like I did end up having to go to like a diabetes specialist and I didn't speak German and they only spoke I didn't speak yeah I didn't speak fluent German they only spoke German whereas my other doctors spoke English so I always had to have a translator go with me so it was like a whole other layer of difficult besides just like oh I I felt like my body was betraying me and like my kids you know yeah Uh. yeah they were born they're born nine weeks early so then we had to do NICU but in a German hospital, which was great. Like we had such good care and right. they have great health care system. So like there was no concerns there. But when like my son, he had some kind of a trauma and we don't know how or why what happened. But now because of 
whatever trauma he experienced, he has cerebral palsy. And he has a, I mean, I don't want to make it worse than it sounds like it is. It is hard. Like he's, he's three, almost three, and he can't walk alone. He has to use a walker or like hold on to things. But he's a lot more mobile than other other people that have CP. And so like, we're grateful, but also it is it is kind of difficult. And yeah, yeah, you internalize a lot of that, that stuff. Like, what did I do to 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 make him like to to harm him and you just end up kind of like it took a long time for me to to let go and to stop to stop blaming myself for what happened to him Uh, yeah there's so much just regular mom guilt Mm -hmm. and then that's you know next level mom guilt (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah, because it was just like everything. It's like I I monitored my blood sugar really well, so I was like, but but is it? Did I do something wrong with that? Did I Ugh. like give myself too much insulin that one night or whatever? And it's like that's impossible because I did exactly what they told me to. But I was just like finding everything that something that I did wrong. Yeah. So I mean, that's another like I don't I don't want any more children just because I have two of them and I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> but like. And I didn't love being pregnant, but like, I just, I couldn't do it again. Yeah. Just, I, like I mentioned before, like I have an anxiety disorder and being pregnant was awful for that anyway, because of everything just made me so frantic. Yeah. And then, yeah, what happened with Alistair? I just don't, I just don't think I could handle it again. Yeah. That's so tough. And you were talking a little bit about how your making, like your art making is, is almost a way to help you through some of these really tough things. Yeah, absolutely. I don't think it's a coincidence that I started painting so again, so so much after we moved back, like we had to move back pretty suddenly, like we kind of ran out of funds. Uh The organization that we we were employed through went went with made an accounting error, and we didn't have the money that we thought we did. So it was like, (laughs) it was kind of fast and and hard move back that we weren't really ready for. Yeah, like we were planning on moving back in July to the States, but then we had to do it in March. So it was kind of a shock. And then we moved back and and that's when I started to paint a little more for the first time since my kids had been born. Yeah. Because I was just too busy before with two newborns. Yeah. So Ooh. I don't I don't think it was a coincidence that like all of that like sudden stuff happening. And like, I, I mean, I don't want to be dramatic, but I feel like I could say like my birth trauma and all that. Yeah. Did kind of drive me to back to painting. Yeah. I mean, those things are so significant. It's it's a huge event. and then it's not just, you know, this, I say event, but it's not just a one time thing. Like it changes everything. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You relive it over and over again, really. And then after you have two newborns to (laughs) to take care of. Right. Yeah. And so like we did the NICU time and that was, that was hard. You usually had to take a bus back and forth or catch rides with people. And then, yeah. So then that took up a lot of time. Yeah, I just didn't really, I didn't feel like picking up a brush or anything when when I still lived in Germany and I was doing the newborn mom thing because I didn't get to go back to work. We tried to, I don't know, I just, I guess I didn't want to let go of it. Like I just, I know that I'm not stay at home mom material. I like to go too much. Yeah. So I was just kind of fighting against it. But then I did end up spending a year as stay at home mom. Yeah. And I just didn't paint any time during then. But I guess it's like the compound stress of like all the coming to terms with what had happened with Alistair and like um, my daughter's name is Penelope and I don't want to like discount her story or anything, but she's very typical. So yeah, I just, I just, when I got back to the States is when I felt like I needed to paint again. Yeah. Sometimes it just takes some time. It's almost like you're, you're taking time to process Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you for sharing all of that. Yeah, I've never, I've never really talked that much about it. It's not, uh, it's not something that I like to to put out a lot online. That like I have a disabled son or right anything like that because I feel like that's that's his story to tell, and I don't want to co opt it from him. Yeah, it is. It is kind of nice to to share that. Yeah. Yeah, because it's a big part of your life, right? Yeah. yeah, and it's a huge part of like my art making. Yeah, yeah, because I have like a whole series about family through shapes and yeah, and like I have little little poem thing yeah. that I wrote. It's not it's not a poem because I'm just not a writer, <laughs> but like I have this little like thing that I wrote about Alistair, and then like it informed a painting that I made. You know, and would you if you have 
that little poem, would it go with the painting? Like, is it part of the title or is it solely just for you? And then it kind of helps make the painting. It was really for me, like, yeah, it's, it's kind of a coming to terms with his disability. Like Mm -hmm. it was just kind of a thing that came to me one day and I I might cry this part. but (laughs) It's just, I I was, it actually came to me during my planning at school one day because I was just thinking, I was like, about him and like all the things that he might have to go through in his life. And, and it said, I I wrote down, I was like, uh, I'm going to cry. Definitely. Um, is that your, your body is broken and I can't love it back together. And it was just kind of a revelation is like, it's not something that I can, I can fix just through love, Yeah, you know? And so that I, I kind of took the emotion that I felt and, drew a little picture to go with it. And I've, I've not been able to capture the picture exactly. I've tried a few times, but I still have the, the little sentence that I wrote and yeah. Yeah. Ugh. So yeah, I'll, sometimes I'll, I'll read that and like it does inform yeah. how I approach a canvas and stuff. Oh, it's a beautiful sentiment. It's, you know, it's sad in some ways, but it's also like, you just pour so much love into him. Mm-hmm. And even if it doesn't fix parts of it, I'm sure it will fix something. Yeah. And he's the happiest little boy I've ever seen. Yeah. So like, that's awesome. I don't know. I, I think about that, like that kind of sad, more morose sentence, but then I yeah. think about his smile and his laugh Yeah, and like him playing with Penelope. And it's just like, you know, he'll make his own way. Yeah, he will. Uh. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. All right, one more. What's your go-to order at your favorite restaurant? So, totally just fun question. Get to know right, this one. This one I really, really thought about from your yeah, list. I love it. I had to think like, what's my favorite restaurant? For one, yeah, I don't know. That's a hard question. Yeah, so I think I nailed it down. There's a really good Greek restaurant nearby. Ooh, and I'm like 95 percent vegetarian. I, I tell myself it's like only when it's really worth it will I eat the meat. <laughs> yeah. So eating at the Greek restaurant is worth it. So I get a euro platter so it's the meat and then basically just a salad because you got like all your veggies and your lettuce yeah yeah that's it the yummy glasses yeah yep yep so that's it i just i always go in there and think oh i'm gonna try the falafel this time but i never do i just euro platter all the way <laughs> you're like i have to have it mm-hmm. yeah nice and then just wrapping up is there anything else you would want to share yeah i don't know just like a word of encouragement to people it's like you can like you can do hard things i tell my students that i tell my kids that we can all do hard things and it is hard to find the time to make art and if that's what you want to do and and still have a career if that's you know if your career is different from your art making and yeah I don't know don't don't spend so much time comparing to people on the internet yes because I do that all the time I find myself I'm like I'm not there's a there's an artist that I follow she like spends a day in the studio and ends up with like 50 paper pieces and it's like oh my gosh Uh. so then I compare myself like I'm not moving fast enough maybe that's where I got my need to hustle last year I don't know but like yeah you're the you you don't have to do that that's that's good for her it doesn't have to be for you right Uh, I love it (laughs) hard hard to follow (laughs) but yeah it's so hard to like so easy to get stuck in that comparison trap yeah Yes. And we're all talking about it, but we're not, we're not listening to ourselves, Yeah, you know, because I, I heard so many people say, it's like, I just got to stop comparing myself. And I say it all the time too, but it doesn't make me stop. <laughs> right. Maybe if you say it enough, eventually <laughs> it'll yeah. sink in. I've got some quotes. So like around my studio, I'm looking at one right now. It says inspiration is always so surprising visitor. And it's by a guy named John O'Donohue, which I just love. Yeah. But I was like, well, above it, I need to be like, stop comparing yourself. Like something real big. Yes. About that one. Big and bold. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So like I have my, my fancy, you know, inspirational ones and I'll have my practical ones. Stop looking at Instagram. <laughs> Turn off your phone. Yeah. You're here to paint, not to look. Yeah. Like the cranky grandma quote, like get off your phone. Yeah. Turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've been, I've been struggling lately with just like not having enough time mm-hmm. for art making. And then it's almost that I'm more than I'm upset that I'm not making art. I'm upset that I don't have things to post because I'm not making art. 
<laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Stop. That's where like an investment that I did do in myself this, I, I did it this year and last year was to get a professional photographer to t- come take photos. And so she took pictures of my work, but then she also took pictures, like she did flat lays of like my sketchbooks mm. and like my little color studies and stuff. So she gave me a lot of good content. So if we're after content, got it. <laughs> I got some of, I got some of that. That's great. So yeah, that'd be a tip I'd give somebody. It's like invest, do that because it helps a lot. I don't have to stress about posting new stuff all the time. Like I got these little fallbacks. Yeah. And then I can just share like what I'm thinking about, you know? Yeah, that's awesome. That is a really good tip. And I think I should do that. I think you should. I think everybody should. Yeah. It is. It really makes you feel good too. It's like, I'm worth this. And then like the way that the photographer will make your pieces look, it's like, these they look like that all the time. But when you see them framed, and I'm just not good at photography anyway. So like seeing it done professionally, I'm just like, wow, it actually looks legit. Yeah. Yeah, because that is a big struggle when you have something that you know in person is gorgeous and amazing Mm -hmm. and, you know, has all this color and texture and then trying like struggling to represent that. Yeah, absolutely. And then like, I, you know, I work all day and I have an hour drive, so I'll paint it at night and then I'll get home and it's dark outside because, you know, it's it's winter, so I can't photograph it. Not that I can do it very well anyway. But the lighting (laughs) is a big part of it. It's a huge part of it. Yeah, But she came to my house and did it so then she did tell me what corner of my house I should be using (laughs) so that was a big help too that's great so she she was like a lighting consultant as well (laughs) yeah she did she really helped me out she's like you always need to take your photos right here this is great I was like all right I will do that nice is there anybody that you would like to give a little shout out to maybe your photographer (laughs) her name's Kaylee Lorraine (laughs) she's out of Athens Georgia if you're interested uh no (laughs) I mean I'll plug her for, for sure but like I I have, like I said before, yeah. like my family, my my sister is a graphic designer. So she helped me so much with branding and teaching me the things that like you need to be visible in a professional way online these days. So she did all that for me. And then like, yeah, the photographer and then like my husband, he's, he's just great. Like he just, yeah, he's always my champion. Like, like I told you that opportunity that I was just kind of like him and hawing about. I was like, I just can't, I'm just not ready. He was like, why not? You need to do it. He's like, he's like, just do it. Yeah. Just do it. You can do this. So he's just always like that. And then like, you know, my parents and everybody who keep my kids when I need them to. And yeah, I just have a really great support network all around me. Good friends that encourage me. So when I'm feeling down, they're always there to pick me back up. Yeah, that's amazing. And that makes such a difference. It does. I can't imagine trying to do this without a supportive group around you. Yeah. Um, And then sort of finally, where can our listeners connect with you online? I have a website website and it's Morgan Auten. That's A-U-T-E-N smith.com. And on Instagram, same name, just underscores in the middle, Morgan underscore Auten underscore Smith. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time and chatting. It was it was really nice. I liked, you know, I feel like there were a lot of like things that we have in common and lots of overlaps. And yeah, yeah that was cool. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting to hear your take on things, too. <laughs> Well, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. It was incredible to talk with Morgan. I felt like we were sort of peeling back an onion and just kept finding more little commonalities and points of connection. Yet so many of her super personal struggles and pieces of advice really resonate widely. I hope you felt that connection too. Morgan's openness in sharing her motherhood experience made such an impact on me. I was floored. And I wanted to just soak in her strength. I, like her, don't share a lot of pictures or info about my kid, but I related deeply to her experience of giving birth abroad and going through a tricky pregnancy in a foreign language. I also loved how she talked about the hustle and not being afraid to just ask for what you want, but then shifting to give yourself time to experiment and explore in your work. Such valuable advice. Take it. Thank you, Morgan. And if you're in the Gainesville, Georgia area, check out her solo show at Inman Perk. Thank you so much for listening. As always, you can reach me at Teaching Artist Podcast on Instagram or Teaching Artist Podcast at gmail.com. Who do you want to hear from? Please share your recommendations of teaching artists. And if you loved this episode, please subscribe, 
leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts and follow me. It really makes a big difference. Thank you. Thank you.